share the mic with such, such brilliance and legacy in every word. This poem was written in 1997 <clears throat> as a response to the Ode to Pete Morisco. Um, and it's called On My Life with Don Baldwin, 1994. <clears throat> Rewriting you, I write myself anew. I know you, Manam. I know your brown hands and your brown face. I sat with you at our hand-me-down for Micah kitchen table over Benson and Hedges and American Spirits to talk about our days as we grow old. In this crazy world, I feel the need to pay tribute to you before it's too late. This poem cannot wait, because for Pete Velasco, he bore the weight of his generation until his dying day, waiting all his life for someone like you to say that he was a Pinoy hero. You see, you were already a Pinoy heroine coming in only to your silver birthday. But in your special way, you gave to others and to me a branch from your tree, a piece of your heart, a part of your life. Don't get me wrong, Mano. I know your strife, but regardless of your pain, you gave love. And you seem to rise above time after time. You continue to climb the ladders of our foremothers and forefathers, living a life built upon souls unknown. You gave and you live an existence to make them known for their struggles and for their troubles, but also for their pride and their sweat. For white mouths taste the sweet grapes of their twisted vines. Their hands were the same color as yours and mine. Our hands did not touch the napes of white women, nor did we have the calluses from pruning shears. We haven't bled from canning metal, and we didn't burn and burn our backs over bending over asparagus. But us, we regret and romanticize the problems of real work, underestimating our present scars, our invisible yet endless tears that drip over reams of paper, matting and concealing the dark bags underneath our eyes from caffeine-induced insomnia. We fear repetition and competition created in an apparatus of systems of domination. We hide behind re-articulated words embedded with ideology that this is not real work. And we find armory, though, in each other's words, words that immortalize the lives of our predecessors who made it through physical destruction. We take a high dosage of these lived experiences to cure our mental sickness of incapacitation, and we write again, and we march as strikers again, and we fight as tireless soldiers again, and we demand justice from the same petty bourgeoisie again. Is this not real work? I know you, Mano. I stand with you. As we try to cut and copy and paste everything to third. <clears throat> Excuse me. The knowledge passed out in leaflets at the marches in the 60s, historical documents that rot in the archives of our struggles. Know that you are not alone in the search of our lost dreams of freedom. Know this, I speak your name. I quote you in every research paper. And every time I got to interview you, it was an honor. I beg for your editorial expertise and your, and your very, very witty, sincere commencements. I reference you and I reference your work because this is real work. Your fingertips have blisters from plastic keys on your air book. Your posture curves over a desk with too many assignments and bills. Your untamed hair scares Vidal Sesson. Your attire brought from thrift store. All of, thrift stores all over the place have a priceless class. Your lungs, much like Che Guevara, suffered from chronic asthma. But your words, your words were unchangeable. Your mind and soul inseparable, your will and strength unstoppable, your foundation unmovable, and your heart irreplicable. I do, I do, very much do know you, Mano. For two, 24 years of my life, your hands cooked for me and made meals that satisfied my stomach and my mind and my moments of hunger. And these moments of hunger, I remember the taste of your Bisaya adobo without spusas. Your bibinka 
up from scratch, your Parmesan egg fat. <laughs> and the way you can make one ugu last an entire month. <laughs> I, can, I can taste the salt and pepper and paprika of your sweat as it poured into your mouth, and I can feel the heat of your rice cooker as it steams up all of our eyes. I can hear your voice retell and relive your youth during your Tatai's asparagus season, when his days of work would never end, and even into the night, even to, into his 80s, and even with his medical degree, he bent over backwards in his flannel of indicates, just to feed our mouths. And so on a full stomach, our mouths have stories to tell. This I want to tell like you, stories of times when we were bruised black and blue. I will tell our children about our times in LA and about our times in the Bay, about our ideas and about our reality, all about the things that you did and you sacrificed, all of it. I, they will never forget that we were strong penis, that we were proud women and that we were resistance and struggle. They will never forget that we are a part of a people undefeated who have always been hungry for justice. We will know that we were not victims, that we had voice, agency, and power in the face of white bosses, racist systems, and we have taken it upon ourselves to replace those ignorant teachers. Let me thank you, Manu, Manu Don, Don White Pinai, Sister Struggle, Diva, Diva. Because while I learned to speak, while I learned to listen, while I learned to cry, you were there for me, Manu, shouting for me. And for this, Manu, puta I owe a debt to you, a debt that I will repay from the deepest part of me. This I know, Manu. This I will always say. your life and is absolutely part of your very fiber like how did that happen and what you know how did it pick you well growing up in Stockton um, in many ways I didn't really understand the context of my life until I left and I went to UCLA and took Asian American Studies and Filipino American Studies classes um, I'm third generation Filipina my grandparents and parents worked in the fields I'm the first generation to not work in the fields but I didn't really understand how my grandparents, both sides, their immigration was part of a larger story of American empire in the Philippines, and that they had been a part of one of the greatest economic stories in the history of the world, which is California agriculture. I didn't realize any of that until I went to UCLA and took Philippine American Studies. And, and then I, you know, when I got to those classes, though, I said, well, there's still a lot missing. Where's Stockton? Where's the story of my community, which was the largest community of Filipinos outside of the Philippines in most of the 20th century? What about community organizations? What about labor? And so I wrote Little Manilas of the Heart. That was my dissertation at Stanford. And uh, I became involved in the Little Manila Foundation and with the Filipino American National Historical Society. So uh, after I published the book and, and we have worked to try to preserve the Little Manila neighborhood, Larry at Leom kept popping up in all of my research. I had learned about Larry at Leom when I was at UCLA and at Stanford, and the, the, the critical role that he had played in the Delano Grape Strike, and I learned that my father actually knew him, and that he had been president of the Filipino community in Stockton. In fact, he lived just a few miles away from where my grandparents lived. You know, I knew nothing about him. It took me until I went to ethnic studies classes to learn about him, and that's a tragedy. Uh, most Filipino American youth in Stockton today don't know who Larry Young is, and he's possibly one of the most pivotal figures in farm labor history, if not California and American labor history. So uh, it became really my work to recover these stories of Filipino America. I've been so privileged to be able to go to Stanford and get my PhD there and to become a professor at San Francisco State and work with thousands of students over the last 13 years I've been a professor. Um, and in my lectures, bringing the story of Filipinos into the larger narrative of how I teach American history. But we need books to do that. We need, I need to, to, to reach audiences that are beyond my classroom. And I especially want to 
to, to reach young people who may never get to my classes and who may never be able to take ethnic studies or Filipino American studies you know, at the college level. And it's hopeful that they do, but we need to get them um, interested and see themselves in American history at a very young age. Um, I didn't see myself in American history until college. Maybe my life would have been different if I, if I had. You know, I think I would have really saw larger horizons for myself, um, but growing up as the child of farm workers and, and grandchild of farm workers in Stockton, I mean, all of their hard work and sacrifice was so that I could come to this moment and be able to choose whatever I wanted to do with my life. And what I want to do is to honor their sacrifice. <laughs> Three, two. Well, you can't tell the story of America without telling the story of Filipinos in America, of Filipino American history. Uh, you can't tell the story of the West. You can't tell the story of California. You can't tell the story of labor migration and empire. Um, and for young Filipino Americans and for all young Americans, they should have books that tell them about the context of their lives and tell them about the struggles for justice that gave them the life that they enjoy today. And so um, as a professional historian, but also someone with nieces and nephews um, who, who need to know this history, I think it's, it's so important right now to bring what we are talking about and researching at the college level to our larger community and most importantly to our youth. Helen. Again, I see, and I get it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> was a little bit from Dawn, and she had so much to say, and, and, and we still have so much of her so that we were able to share her everywhere we go in, 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 in the future research papers and the stories that we tell our children. Um, and, and oh, look, she's smiling.